This is the Best of Fair Mormon on the Mormon Faircast. This presentation was given by Fair Mormon volunteer Mike Parker at the Tabernacle in St. George, Utah on February 27, 2015. The title of the presentation is The Challenge and Choice of Faith. To what Elder Dooley said, if I, if I may, he said there would be no applause at the end of the uh, presentation. I would also appreciate it if there was no lobbying of produce, <laughs> dairy products, so forth. Um, I'm truly humbled to be here, um, especially in light of the people who have spoken in this room over the many, many decades that uh, it, it's been in this place, including presidents of the church um, and other very notable figures. Um, uh, and it, I have a hard time feeling like I'm going to be able to measure up to some of the people who have stood at this podium, but I, I, will, I will do my best, and I appreciate your patience with me. Um, Elder Dooley gave you a little bit of an introduction to, to Fair Mormon, um, and I want to go into just a little bit more detail before we, uh, before we proceed. Uh, out of curiosity, though, I'd be interested to see by a show of hands how many people are at least aware of Fair Mormon as an organization. Okay, maybe, maybe 10, 10 to 20 percent or so. Okay. Um, as he mentioned, Fair Mormon was an organization founded in 1997. It originally got started on uh, what was then America Online uh, chat rooms, uh, where there was a lot of criticism of the church going on, and members of the church who were in there who felt that they needed to, to stand up and defend the church organized and banded together and formed this organization, which eventually became. Um, uh, a foundation. It's a, it's a 501c3 organization. And since then, we've expanded our operations uh, uh, quite a bit. And that includes not only a website that we run, but also a, um, a wiki, which is, if you're familiar with Wikipedia, similar to that, it's an, an online encyclopedia of virtually every criticism that's ever been lobbed against the church or the restored gospel with a measured response and, and, and scholarly research behind that. Um, we also have a blog where we post updates. There's a podcast where there are at least five or six different uh, podcasts going on every week if you're, uh, if you're into that sort of thing. We have a Facebook page and a YouTube channel and, and all the interwebs. We are just, uh, we're, we're everywhere, but it's, it's largely organized online. And as you mentioned, the, the main website for Fair Mormon is fairmormon.org. That's F A I R as in fair and, and balanced and so forth, fairmormon.org. I do want to mention that just as, as he said, that fair does not represent the church. I do not represent fair. I am a volunteer with, with Fair Mormon. Um, but the things that I'm going to say tonight represent my own uh, understanding and my own opinion and so forth. So if I misspeak on any particular item, please uh, forgive me and do not hold it against, uh, against Fair Mormon. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that what Fair Mormon is, is primarily interested in is in working with members and in interested non-members, people who sincerely have questions that they would like to address, things that they can't find answers to. We are not at all interested in debating with critics or in um, uh, Bible bashing, I think was the term that we used on my mission. Uh, and so forth. We've, in fact, there was some of that very early on, about 25 years ago, and, and or I'm sorry, about 20 years ago, and we, we had simply moved past that simply because it's so fruitless. Um, so what we are interested in is helping members and, and interested non-members who have questions and, and are looking for reasons to believe. That's primarily what we're, we're interested in, is, is helping people maintain uh, their faith. Pardon me. The topic that I asked to speak on tonight is the challenge and choice of faith. And I'd like to examine faith tonight as a choice, a decision that we make on an ongoing basis to believe and to act on those beliefs. Um, I guess it's probably best to start off by defining what we mean by, by faith, because that, that word actually means uh, quite a bit, um, and I'd like to find it in, in a very specific context that fits within the doctrine of the restored gospel, um, and that faith is not merely belief, it is trust. 
Let me share with you a quote from Elder Richard G. Scott that he gave in general conference a number of years ago. Elder Scott says, quote, To exercise faith is to trust that the Lord knows what he is doing with you and that he can accomplish it for your eternal good, even though you cannot understand how he can possibly do it. We are like infants in our understanding of eternal matters and their impact on us here in mortality. Yet at times, we act as if we knew it all. When you pass through trials for his purposes, as you trust him, exercise faith in him, he will help you. That support will generally come step by step, a portion at a time. While you are passing through each phase, the pain and difficulty that comes from being enlarged will continue. If all matters were immediately resolved at your first petition, you could not grow." Unquote. When I have faith in Christ, when anyone has faith in Christ, we don't just believe in Christ. We believe Christ. We believe in the things that he says. When he says, for example, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, we trust him that that statement is true. That regardless of what I have done, regardless of any sins that I have committed, that I am never too far where I cannot come back, and that he can make me clean. That is faith. It's not believing in Christ. It's not believing in that there was a, a man named Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago and, and taught some nice stuff and then got executed by the Romans, and that was the end of that. It's about believing that the things that he taught will actually come to pass. That is trust. I believe that Christ can make me a better person. He can cleanse me of my sins. He can bring me back into the presence of the Father. My faith in him is trust that he will do all these things if I choose to place my trust in him, my confidence in him, and then act upon that. And this brings me to the real point that I want to make tonight, and, and this is why I chose uh, the subject or the topic for my talk, is that faith is a choice. It's not automatic. It's not the default position. Once you're baptized, you just don't have faith. It's not like holding something in your hand or, or having a, um, uh, you know, having a, a strange uh, birthmark or something like that where it's just kind of there. It's something that I choose to do. Every day, I have to get up in the morning and I have to decide, what am I going to do today? What kind of person am I going to be? And most important, am I going to place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that he can and will direct my actions? Why do I choose to do this? Well, because the Lord and his servants are shown that they are trustworthy. I have tested their words and found that my life is happier, richer, fuller, there's more joy, there's more sense of fulfillment than if I do not choose to do that. My family is closer. I have a greater love for friends and neighbors and even my enemies. And I have reassurance that all these things will continue after this life and for eternity. Unfortunately, there are some people in this world who don't understand that people of faith are actively choosing that path. Some critics of our faith claim that Mormons do what they're told to do, that we practice blind obedience. We're even accused of being uh, drones in some sort of a collective, like, like bees or ants, um, that if we believe all the same things and just nod our heads in agreement every time we're told that we should believe or do something, you know, therefore we're, we don't think about things. We've even been called uh, by some people the morgue, which is uh, a not terribly funny play on words of the Borg from Star Trek. If any of you are familiar with Star Trek, there is a, one of the villains in Star Trek is this collective group. They are made up of lots of uh, 
individuals, but there are no individual personalities. They all have kind of a hive mind and they all think and act together. And so uh, some of our critics have, have jokingly referred to us as not as the Borg, but as the Morgue, the Mormon Borg, that none of us have any independent thoughts that we just all kind of think and act and, and, and do alike and so forth. Now, to be honest with you, anyone who's been to a high priest group meeting will know the kind of disagreements that come up in there and how passionately we will discuss them. And I imagine the same thing is true in Relief Society. I haven't been there, but, you know, we don't all agree on things. We are not a collective agency. But the fact is, is that every group has common beliefs and convictions that hold it together. If you're a member of the church and you disagree with everything that it stands for, why are you a member? Clearly, if you're going to belong to an organization, you have to have something in common with them. So I think it's unfair to refer to us as, as drones or unthinking and so forth. We have common beliefs, but around the edges, there's quite a bit of room for disagreement and, and even debate about things. It's absurd to think, for example, that someone would be a part of Occupy Wall Street and yet completely disagree with the fundamental claims of the Occupy movement, that you, you know, believe that, that big banking is a, a wonderful thing and uh, you know, the capitalism is the end-all and be-all and, and, and so forth, and you know, why would you want to be a part of, of the Occupy movement if you believe those things? If you really want to see a hive mind, uh, go to inter any internet message board, whether it's political or otherwise, and see people kind of cheerleading, walking, uh, encouraging each other on. Uh, you know, I've been on a number of boards where that was almost frightening, with just the kind of uh, intensity that people have where everyone who is here, we're all standing together and it's the enemy is out there and we have to, we must destroy them and so forth. That's, that's really frightening. You don't find that in, in the church, at least not in my experience. I think the problem that some people have is that while we are independent thinkers, some people want us to be more independent uh, in the way that they are. And that's where the real problem lies. It's not in our independence, it's in the fact that many of us don't agree with a certain individual, and that person then has a problem with the fact that many people don't agree with them. It's human nature to associate with people that you agree with, at least on fundamental things. When I offer my obedience to the Lord and his servants, it's not because I'm an unthinking drone, it's a conscious choice that I make because I trust that the results of that obedience will bring me happiness and peace. There is nothing that prevents me from violating the commandments, openly or, or in secret. There is no church police who will come to my door and drag me off to the bishop's office because I was drinking an alcoholic beverage or because I only paid 9% on my tithing or perhaps I watched an inappropriate movie. When I go to tithing settlement, the bishop asks me one question. Are you a full tithe payer? And he accepts my answer. He doesn't ask me for my W-2s. <laughs> At least he shouldn't. Anyone ha ever had their bishop ask him for their, their W-2s? <laughs> Every once in a while we do get that. Someone, the, the bishop, uh, yeah, yeah, I, that, I don't think that happens. Now, of course, there are certain privileges that I would cut myself off from if I chose to engage in certain activities that are outside of the doctrine and practice of the church. And I'm thinking mainly of um, access to the temple, the temple recommend privilege. That's a privilege. That's not a right. If I choose certain beliefs and certain behaviors, then I qualify for a temple recommend. But if I don't choose those things, I just don't get to go to the temple. That's all. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And if I don't believe in the church and I want to do things that are contrary to church doctrine and practice, why would I want to go to the temple? Because the temple teaches me that I need to do those things. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. There's, there's, no, there's no privileges in the church that are just simply automatic regardless of what you do. I choose to believe, I choose to act on that belief by being obedient and I qualify for certain blessings. If I don't believe in those things, then I'm free to leave if I wish. No one shows up at 12.45 on Sunday tells me, get dressed, you're going to church, and then drag me out. It doesn't work that way. Elder Boyd K. Packer, a number of years ago, excuse me, said, this is Elder Packer, quote, Latter-day Saints are not obedient because they are compelled to be obedient. 
They are obedient because they know certain spiritual truths and have decided as an expression of their own individual agency to obey the commandments of God. We are the sons and daughters of God, willing followers, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, and under this head are we made free. Those who talk of blind obedience may appear to know many things, but they do not understand the doctrines of the gospel. There is an obedience that comes from a knowledge of the truth that transcends any external form of control. We are not obedient because we are blind. We are obedient because we can see. I love that quote, especially the last part there. We are not obedient because we are blind. We are obedient because we can see. Brigham Young said, quote, What a pity it would be if we were led by one man to utter destruction. Are you afraid of this? I am more afraid that this people have so much confidence in their leaders that they will not inquire for themselves of God whether they are led by him. I am fearful they settle down into a state of blind self-security, trusting their eternal destiny in the hands of their leaders with a reckless confidence that in itself would thwart the purposes of God in their salvation and weaken that influence that they could give to their leaders. Did they know for themselves by the revelations of Jesus that they are led in the right way? Let every man and woman know by the whispering of the Spirit of God to themselves whether their leaders are walking in the path the Lord dictates or not. This has been my exhortation continually. Does that sound like blind obedience? And Brigham Young is kind of generally known for somebody who was really big on obedience. And there are many other quotes that he gave that are similar to that. That we shouldn't just blindly trust. That we should ask. Sometimes we get this in the church. That there's this uh, idea that gets out there that says that anytime a leader asks me to do something, even if I don't understand it or agree with it, if I do it, I'll be blessed. And I have to say I don't agree with that. And I've actually read some quotes from other leaders of the church who have said the same thing. That that's actually a dangerous concept, that what we need to do is we need to get a testimony before we act. We are not beholden to blind obedience. If you are asked to do something that you don't agree with or you have a problem with or a question about, ask. Get a spiritual prompting. Get a confirmation. That's the kind of attitude we should have every time that we go to general conference. What can I get out of this that's going to make me a better person? And if I hear something that bothers me or that I'm not certain about, do I pray about it? Do I ask for confirmation? So Latter-day Saints believe that faith is a choice best made intelligently. The Lord told Oliver Cowdery that the key to success in inspired translation of the Book of Mormon was you must study it out in your mind, then you must ask me if it be right. The Lord later exhorted the elders at Kirtland to, quote, seek ye out of the best books, words of wisdom, seek learning, even by study and also by faith. The Lord expects us to be intelligent and informed and to make choices carefully after study and prayer, not blindly and not ignorantly. Elder Harold B. Lee, in the early 1960s even said, the future of the church depends on those who are both faithful and learned. The glory of God is intelligence. The fundamental principle of the gospel. We are not into blind obedience. There are some real challenges to faith today. Probably the greatest of these is when we don't have enough information to act on. And so questions and doubts arise. Each of us in this room has questions. Many of us have doubts. They're inescapable. I have questions about things that I don't understand. I have doubts regarding things about which I have not received a sure knowledge. And that's okay to admit. Four times in the scripture, we are commanded to doubt not. But I don't think that that makes doubt a sin. Rather, I see faith and doubt as two sides of the same coin. If I have faith, I must therefore have some doubt. Some things I question or don't understand. Otherwise, I wouldn't have faith. I would have perfect knowledge. Faith implies that I don't know everything. And therefore, what's in that realm of the things I don't know or don't understand? Questions, maybe doubts. 
When the brother of Jared saw the Lord on Mount Shalem, Mormon tells us that he had faith no longer, for he knew nothing doubting. That's when you can say, I have no more doubts, when you've seen the Lord. The Lord taught the Nephites that we are more blessed in believing in the words of those who have seen the Lord than if we had seen the Lord ourselves. It is more blessed to believe on the words of the witnesses than to be a witness. It's very similar to what uh, he told Thomas, uh, the doubting apostle, a week after his resurrection when he appeared to him. And he told Thomas, because you have seen, blessed are you, blessed are more blessed, blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. Joseph Smith revealed that, quote, to some it is given by the Holy Ghost to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he was crucified for the sins of the world. To others it is given to believe on their words that they also might have eternal life if they continue faithful. Now, generally speaking, that's a scripture that's in section 46 of the Doctrine of Heaven. It's been interpreted to say that there are many members of the church who have a spiritual witness and therefore they know, and that there are some others, a few perhaps, who don't have a spiritual witness and they believe on those who know. And I, actually, I don't agree with that interpretation. I think what's being said there is that there have been some who have given to know because they have seen the Lord. They've been in a situation like the brother of Jared. They're the prophets, the apostles, who have that sure knowledge. They have that witness. And to the rest of us, and that includes me, if we believe on their words, we may also have eternal life if we continue faithful. So when the Lord asks us to doubt not, I think what he's saying is that we should be actively magnifying our faith, seeking to find answers to questions, and place trust in him that we will find those answers eventually. Not all answers come immediately. Along the way, we're going to struggle with questions and doubts. The key is not to let my doubts drive me, motivate me, become my my base course. Am I piloted by my doubts, or am I piloted by my faith? I don't think we should be piloted by our doubts. In other words, use doubt appropriately as a motivator to learn more, to question more, to seek, to find. Similarly, we would use guilt for sin appropriately to repent, to seek to become better, rather than to wallow in sin and you know, awful person. Yeah, there's no hope for me, and so forth. Which do I? Which direction do I go when I'm looking to repent? Do I repent, or do I not repent? Do I decide that I'm not worthy, and so forth? But the obvious answer is I repent and I move forward. Same thing with doubt. The Lord encouraged Oliver Cowdery, if you desire a further witness, cast your mind upon the night that you cried unto me in your heart, that you might know concerning the truth of these things. Did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? What greater witness can you have than from God? When we wallow in doubt, or guilt for that matter, and allow it to consume us, then we begin to question everything, including those things about which we have previously received spiritual confirmations. And that's the real trap. It's a spiral that leads ever downward. I've spoken to a few people before this meeting who have come here who, who know people who are trapped in that spiral, who have a problem, a question, a doubt, a struggle that they've had, and that they allow it to eat at them. And the next thing you know, more doubts come in, more questions come in, and before long, they've questioned everything. Many of you are familiar with the principle that's taught in the scriptures uh, that the Lord will teach us line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, that we work in, a, in an upward spiral as we receive a commandment and we accept it and believe it and practice it, then the Lord will eventually confirm to us that what we are doing is right and will give us further commandments. There's that story that's found in the book of Moses. It's also repeated in, in sacred places about Adam and how he was told to sacrifice. And he began to sacrifice and so forth. And after many days, an angel of the Lord appeared to Adam and said, why do you offer sacrifices unto the Lord? Adam says, I don't know. The Lord told me to. 
So the angel then explains to him why he's doing this. And he goes on to give him further commandments, that you're supposed to do everything that you do in the name of the Son and so forth. This is the way that our spiritual progress should be working. You see the commandment, find out if it's true, embrace it, live it, get that spiritual confirmation that it's true, and then receive further commandments, and we work our way upward, spiritually speaking. However, it's important to note that the same process also works in reverse, that you can go downward in a spiral, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here's a quote from Alma. Alma, this is Alma the Younger, in the Book of Mormon. Quote, Therefore he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he know them in full. And they that will harden their hearts, to them is given the lesser portion of the word, until they know nothing concerning his mysteries. And then they are taken captive by the devil and led by his will down to destruction. Notice the spiritual progress, the path that's taking place there. That I'm here, wherever here is, and I can either accept and embrace and seek spiritual confirmation and spiral upwards, or I can doubt and allow that doubt to drive me, and I can question even further, and I mean question in an inappropriate sense, which I'll get to in just a moment, in a sense where I'm losing what I already have until I've reached nothing. Some of you may know people who are in that situation. We used to have very powerful testimonies and now have simply turned their back on everything. They reject everything and they've forgotten what they once knew. Brothers and sisters, would to God that we could have such faith. One that places doubt in proper, proper perspective. That faith would be the greater of doubt, not the lesser. Unfortunately, there are people in the world today who are actively seeking to destroy faith by fostering and encouraging doubt. These, these people have always existed. Uh, their voices are now magnified a thousandfold by the Internet and its reach. And so there are websites, blogs, message boards, and podcasts actively dedicated to sowing doubt and destroying faith. Even society in general is rapidly becoming more secular and more hostile to faith all the time. This has been a real sea change. I'm not that old. I'm 46, so I'll confess. And I have seen, in just my short lifetime, a massive shift in culture from one that is at least, at the very least, amenable to faith to one that is openly hostile to faith. Uh, the so-called new atheism, led by writers like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and the late Christopher Hitchens, it's rapidly gaining adherence, and these individuals are not satisfied to simply disbelieve. They often feel that they must also tear down the faith of others. Many years ago, before the widespread availability of the Internet, the greatest challenge to believing Latter-day Saints came from other religions, came from largely Protestant Christians, some of whom disagree with our doctrines, strongly enough that they were willing to attack them in print, in film, um, and, and by other means. While that challenge still exists, it's been almost completely eclipsed by the secular humanists and atheists, critics, both outside and inside the church. It simply is, I don't want to say it's not a problem, but it is, it, it simply disappeared the sectarian criticisms of the church are nothing in comparison to the onslaught of secular criticisms that we're receiving today. Here's a recent example of the type of criticism we face. Um, some of you may be aware, uh, a few weeks ago, church leaders in Salt Lake, they um, organized a press conference. And at the press conference, there were, uh, I believe it was three members of the Quorum of the Twelve, uh, Elder Oaks, Elder Holland, and Elder Christofferson, if I'm not mistaken, who all spoke about uh, the church, on the one hand, issuing public support for laws in the state of Utah that would protect gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people from discrimination in housing and employment. And at the same time, they also asked for laws that would protect religious expression, that would protect the right of people to say, and specifically the church to say, that we respect the rights 
of others. However, we do not feel compelled to adopt their beliefs. This is a real challenge that we're facing because the way that society is going, um, gay marriage will very quickly be, I have no doubt, will be the law of the United States. The Supreme Court will hear this later in the spring. Uh, and 99.9% .9 they are going to rule in, in favor of, of universal gay marriage. So the question then becomes, what of religious faith? Are religious ministers then compelled to solemnize gay marriages? Would we be compelled to solemnize gay marriages in our temples or our chapels and so forth? And so the church was asking for protections for religious expression, to say that this is not part of our doctrine, this is not what we believe in, that we respect the rights of others, but that they should also respect our rights. There were many responses to this um, in the press, and it came very quickly. It was, a, it was a, a media frenzy that day. Here was a response from one blogger who blogged at the New York Times. Now, the New York Times is, is supposedly the paper of record, right? His response was withering. This is a quote. The Mormon Church is now willing, news accounts say, to support anti-discrimination legislation in the realms of housing and employment. In return, all the Mormons want are laws that protect religious freedom. We already have that. It's called the Bill of Rights. So what is the church really after? What they want is a legal permission to use their religion as an excuse to discriminate. You see where he's going with this? The discrimination of any form is now the buzzword. And if you are discriminating, you know, discriminating actually used to have, have, a, have a good connotation. If you had discriminating taste, for example, that's a positive thing, right? And we all discriminate in our lives. We choose who we are going to associate with. We choose what clothes we are going to buy and wear. We choose what food we are going to eat. We all discriminate. I choose not to eat the chili cheese fries and instead to have a salad. Sometimes. <laughs> Occasionally. Am I discriminating against chili cheese fries if I eat a salad? I am. I am making a judgment call to say that the chili cheese fries are bad for me and the salad is good for me. That does not say that chili cheese fries are bad for everyone or that no one should buy chili cheese fries. All I'm saying is that I prefer salad and I want the right to have my salad, please. Do not force me to have chili cheese fries when what I really want is a salad. The church does not discriminate in the sense that leaders of the church have come forward and said, we respect the rights of all people, including people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, to be free from discrimination in housing and employment. We are not looking to make those activities legal to discriminate. What we are asking for is our right to not have to adopt every gen or every um, sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? Every cultural value of the world to define for ourselves what we believe and how we will practice. And unfortunately, to many people in the world, that is, you know, we've reached the pinnacle of, of, of horrible people when you decide I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to tolerate all things. Tolerance is, is the big buzzword today. It's kind of funny how people who, who, who claim to be for tolerance, though, are quite often the most intolerant when you tell them that, well, I don't accept something, and then they're not tolerant of you. Unfortunately, in addition to these criticisms that we're receiving from outside the church, we also have a small number of dissidents within the church who are extremely vocal, who want the church to abandon some of its core beliefs and adopt more modern and enlightened, and I use those terms in quotes, traditions and beliefs. Some of the issues they champion include changing our beliefs on marriage, um, de-escalating the seriousness of, of sexual activity outside of marriage, uh, ordaining women to the priesthood, and so forth. And largely the church's position on this has been that you can believe whatever you want. There are many people within the church who believe that gay marriage should be legal. And there is no problem with that or who believe that women should be ordained to the priesthood. And there is no problem with that. Where it becomes a problem 
is when people begin to organize. And they, get, and they march on Temple Square. And they organize petition drives to ask the brethren to go and ask the Lord if they really got it right. And so forth. And so some of you may be familiar with some individuals recently who, it's been very widely broadcast in the news, have been excommunicated from the church for not their views, but the fact that they organize and they disseminate their views and they gain a following. That becomes a problem. Anyone in the church is free to believe anything that they want. What you're not free to do is to preach whatever you want. And there's a difference between those things. Now, oddly enough, that's a challenge from one side of the spectrum in the church. This, this sort of, I don't like to use the word liberal because it has, it has a political connotation, but that's, from a theological standpoint, that's the direction they're going, that there's a liberal brand of Protestantism that is very open and, and accepting of all kinds of lifestyles and so forth. So when I say liberal, I don't mean left-wing, progressive, Democrat kind of thing. I'm talking about liberal theology. The odd thing is, is that we're also receiving pressure from the opposite end, from a very fundamentalist group of people who don't think that the brethren have it right either, except that the problem is, is that the brethren haven't adopted some of the more, uh, shall we say, difficult concepts and teachings that were found in the church in certain time periods. Uh, there are some individuals who have been organizing uh, who are trying to say that unless you have received the second comforter, unless you've received the presence of Jesus Christ in your life, you don't really have faith and, and so forth. And there are groups that have actually broken off from the church, some of, of whom these leaders have been excommunicated very recently. Uh, there's one group in Arizona, for example, that has claimed to have baptized about 500 Latter-day Saints into their movement, um, who believe, and it, this is somewhat similar to what we see out in, in, in the fundamentalist polygamous movements, where the church isn't quite churchy enough, that they aren't following the old ways and things, that the leaders of the church aren't teaching the things that they used to teach. So we have this kind of odd pressure coming from both sides, this very, we need to uh, adopt gay marriage and alternative lifestyles and ordination of women and so forth. And on the other end, we have this, the church leaders have lost the keys and they're, they're not teaching the right things and we're going we're gonna to reorganize the church. This has really been going on since 1830. It's just become more vocal and more, um, more wide, uh, widespread in the press and so forth because of the internet. Now there's a third challenge that lies between those two extremes. And that challenge comes from Mormon culture itself. So I'd like to address a couple of examples of that. One of the problems that we face is the use of the phrase, I know, when bearing testimony. This is a very common practice in the church. We've all done it. And Fast Sunday is coming up, and I can guarantee you that 99% of the people who get up at the pulpit in your ward are going to begin with by saying that I know the church is true or I know that the gospel is true and so forth. Now that's kind of Mormon lingo. We know what people are saying when they say that. What they mean is, is I have a testimony. I have a spiritual witness. I've received the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost has confirmed to me that these things are true and I choose to act upon them. That's what they're talking about. It's a euphemism, in other words. However, some people don't understand that. And I think that sometimes we become our own worst enemies because they think to themselves, all of these people are getting up and saying, I know the church is true, but I don't. I think it's true, but I don't really know. Is there something wrong with me? Put yourself in their shoes for just a moment and think kind of the impact that it has. It, it, it's, a, it's a Mormonism, a Mormon cultural thing that we do, that we get up and we say, well, I know the church is true. It causes some people to question, do I really know? Another thing in, in Mormon culture, uh, we have a tendency to put the leaders of our church on pedestals, some of them so high that they can never truly measure up to them. The church has been led by great men and women, but they were and are human beings who sometimes make mistakes. And that's okay to admit that, that not everything that has ever been done or said by a leader of the church has to be inspired. They do not walk around 
with you know God on on speed dial and and constantly you know when, when President Monson goes to have lunch and he says you know what I don't think I'd like to have broccoli today that doesn't mean that broccoli is is cursed and and so forth and that none of us should have broccoli that's an extreme example I, I no one actually believes that but <laughs> tell you what it's better if I use uh, President uh, Dieter Dorf's comments on this he can say it better than I can this was in a recent general conference. He said, quote, to be perfectly frank, there have been times in the history of the church when members or leaders of the church have simply made mistakes. There may have been things said or done that were not in harmony with our values, principles, or doctrine. I suppose the church would be perfect only if it were run by perfect beings. God is perfect and his doctrine is pure. But he works through us, his imperfect children, and imperfect people make mistakes. It is unfortunate that some have stumbled because of mistakes made by men. In spite of this, the eternal truth of the restored gospel found in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not tarnished, diminished, or destroyed. As an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is again continuing the quote, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and as one who has seen firsthand the counsels and workings of this church, I bear solemn witness that no decision of significance affecting this church or its members is ever made without earnestly seeking the inspiration, guidance, and approbation of our Eternal Father. This is the Church of Jesus Christ. God will not allow his church to drift from its appointed course or fail to fulfill its divine destiny. Unquote. That is a marvelous quote because I think he puts into perspective another quote that many of us are familiar with. Some of us uh, would imagine just about everybody in the room has probably heard that the Lord will not allow the leaders of the church to lead the church astray. People, you've heard this, right? It's actually found in Wilford Rudolph's comments under the manifesto, official proclamation number one in our Doctrine and Covenants. If you've ever read, it's got the manifesto in there, and then below that there are selected quotes from Wilford Rudolph indicating that it's okay, that the church is going to go on, we're going to be all right, and so forth. And that quote is in there, that God will not allow his leaders to lead the church astray. What he is saying there, though, and this is what President Dukdorf is, is commenting on, is that in the long run, in the overall scheme of things, the church is headed in the right direction, and it is not going to turn off of its course. There are going to be mistakes. There are going to be times when the church stumbles, when leaders of the church enact a program or a policy that turns out to be not a good idea. Some of you may remember, I'll give you one example, may remember the early 1980s, and the first presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve announced that missionaries, uh, male missionaries, that their term of service was going to be reduced from 24 months to 18 months. Does anybody remember that? Does anybody remember how long that lasted? About a year and a half. And then they reversed it. Because it had the effect that you would expect it to have. It cut our missionary force by, by a quarter. And so they just reversed it. That's an example of a policy change. Well intended. I'm sure that they counseled together. I'm sure that they prayed about it. And I'm sure that they enacted it with all the right intentions, and it turned out to be not the right thing. And so they changed it back. However, those occasional missteps are not going to divert the church from its long-term objective, and that is to become the kingdom of God on earth. That is what we are striving for. And I think that's what President Nathrop is trying to say. And that brings me to what is perhaps the greatest challenge to faith of all, and that challenges ourselves. It's our pride and our unwillingness to admit that maybe we don't have all the answers. Nephi lamented that there are some people who, when they are learned, they think they are wise. And there's a difference between the two. We need to be humble. We need to admit when we don't have all the answers, and that's going to be all the time. There are many, many times when I've had to remind myself, or my wife has had to remind me, that I don't know everything, and that maybe it's best if I just keep my mouth shut and let things ride and see what happens. And in virtually every instance, that's turned out to be good counsel. So some specific recommendations here as, as I close. How do we deal? with these things. Now, you'll notice, by the way, before I get into this, I have addressed a lot of specific criticisms of the church, and I haven't mentioned any specific names of people. Um, 
in a few moments, we're going to have a question and answer session. And if you have specific questions about those things, I'd be happy to, to entertain some of those if I can. So, recommendations. How do we stay on the path of faith? How do we choose faith and not let doubt consume us? Number one, love. The Savior enjoined us to love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. We must love. We should never rejoice or feel self-satisfaction when someone who is critical of the church walks away or is excommunicated, ever. We should be in mourning because brother or sister has been lost, and we should seek them out. Number two is pray. That's an obvious one. I don't know if there's anything else I could say. I just have a pray. That's it. Just pray. Study the scriptures. Study good books. Study. Seek learning by study and also by faith. Scripture I quoted before. And as we study, don't just ask questions. Look for answers. Ask around. Are there answers to be had to your questions? Another one, and this is a really hard one for many people because we are a church, in many cases, of sure knowledge. I talked before about the testimony meetings to get up on a know the truth is true and so forth. We need to, the term that I like to use is embrace ambiguity. There are many things that we don't know, and it's okay to admit that we see through a glass darkly, as the Apostle Paul said. Be humble enough to admit there are things we don't know. We walk by faith and not by sight. While we study, we need to study church history. We need to understand our background, more than the stuff that we get in, in, in Sunday school, in gospel doctrine classes, in that kind of very surface approach. We need to understand these things. We're going to be equipped and use reliable resources. One of the best that's out now is the Joseph Smith Papers. Some of you may be familiar with that. They're the very expensive volumes that you could find at Deseret Book, but they also have an online website, josephsmithpapers.org, where the church is in the process of publishing literally everything ever written by or directed to be written by the prophet Joseph Smith. It's all out there. The church is being transparent in a way that it has never been before. Another good resource, if I may be so bold and, and plug the organization that I come here as a volunteer, is Fair Mormon, fairmormon.org. We have tried to arrange an answer to just about every criticism or question that is out there. And if you can't find it, we also have a service where you can write just Fair Mormon questions. It's right there on the website. You can click on it. You can submit questions to volunteers, and we have about 150 or so volunteers, all of whom will see your email, and some of whom will respond and try to help. Along with embracing ambiguity, this next one is to have reasonable expectations of church members, church leaders, and the church experience. Too often we expect perfection from people and programs in the church. And while this is the Lord's church and its policies and programs are inspired, it is run by human beings. It's no more true at any level than on the ward level. And I'm sure that many of you have seen that, that people sometimes do dumb things. And that's okay, because we're all humble. And we just sometimes don't get it. Even people have been called to great callings have done dumb things. And that's okay. We need to accept that fact. And we need to admit, still the Lord's church. One more suggestion. Be patient. A fair Mormon volunteer by the name of uh, Neil Rapley, who I consider a friend, he recently wrote something I thought was quite profound on this. It was a quote. No matter how inquisitive you are, at some point you must come to terms with two facts. Number one, there will always be more questions than answers. Always. This will never change, at least not in this life. Number two, there will always be more questions than time to pursue answers. And again, this is just always how it will be. I don't say this to discourage asking questions. Rather, because of these two facts, one must hone in on how to ask better questions and how to judge which questions are most worthy to spend time on." Unquote. Patience. 
So in closing, um, a couple of quotes here. President Newport from the same talk that I was referencing earlier. Quote, my dear brothers and sisters, my dear friends, please first doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. You must never allow doubt to hold us, I'm sorry, we must never allow doubt to hold us prisoner and keep us from the divine love, peace, and gifts that come through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Unquote. And then Elder M. Russell Ballard, this was in just last October's general conference. Quote, brothers and sisters, stay in the boat. Use your life jackets and hold on with both hands. Avoid distractions. And if any one of you have fallen out of the boat, we will seek you, find you, minister to you, and pull you safely back onto the old ship sign where God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ are at the helm and will guide us right. Unquote. In conclusion, I've chosen the tender words of Lehi, speaking as a parent. Quote, and now, my sons, I would that you should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments and be faithful unto his words and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit and not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh and the evil which is therein. Brothers and sisters, I have a testimony that this church is run by men and women who are inspired of God. And that 15 of these men hold the keys. And those keys unlock doors to salvation. One of the most touching passages in the scripture for me comes from John chapter 6, where Jesus has just taught some very difficult things. And many of his followers, it says, turned away. They walked no more with him. And Jesus, at that point, turns to his intimate disciples, his apostles and says, will you also go away? And Peter responds and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Brothers and sisters, whatever questions we have, whatever doubts we have, whatever disagreements we may have with the church, where else can we go? The church and the brethren who hold the keys and the men and women who lead this church can open the doors of salvation for us. It's through that that I expect to be on the other side of the veil with my wife and my three children, one of whom was taken in an accident almost three years ago. Where else can I go? The answer is nowhere. I bear that testimony, and I do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.